everyone, and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Edith Harold, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups with the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host this webinar discussing the First Amendment in trademark law after Vidal v. Elster. Speaking on this panel today, we have professors Barbara Laureate of Texas Tech, Lisa Ramsey of the University of San Diego, and Eugene Volok of the UCLA School of Law. As our moderator, we're joined by Professor Tzvi Rosen of Southern Illinois University School of Law. If you'd like to learn more about today's moderator or speakers, their full bios can be viewed on our website, fedsoc.org. Near the end of the program, we'll turn to the audience for questions. If you have a question, you can enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can. Finally, I'll note that, as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speakers, not the Federalist Society. With that, Professor Rosen, thank you for joining us today, and I'll hand things over to you. Thank you, Edith. So this was a case um, that, really, that went in a very interesting direction about the term Trump too small. And uh, Steve Elster tried to register it for a trademark for t-shirts. And the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office denied registration on the ground that it violated Section 2C of the Lanham Act. Which Section 2C is, says that it, it's something can be registered for a trademark if it consists of or comprises a name, portrait, or a signature in identifying a particular living individual except by his written consent. Obviously, the living individual is Donald Trump. Is that constitutional? Um, well, there's an interesting question there, because pretty much everyone agrees it is, but they can't agree as to why. It gets one of the most fractured decisions where everyone agrees in recent memory. And we already had a Courthouse Steps decision podcast with John Farmer and Michael Friedland, um, who are wonderful practitioners from Virginia and California, on this decision. This, this webinar is be much more about, okay, well, what does this mean going forward? Uh, just to recap briefly, after the Tam and Brunetti cases, which, which concerned uh, trademarks that were alleged to be racially um, uh, um, um, motivated and scandalous, Brunetti with, with F-U-C-T trademark, these left the door open to consider the constitutionality of viewpoint neutral content based on uh, um, tra uh, trademark restrictions. The Thomas opinion, Justice Thomas writing for, from, uh, writing for a court, really looks at the history and tradition of trademark law. Um, he references Beverly Padishall and Frank Schechter's work a lot, really some of the fundamental, but also kind of older works on the um, history of trademark law. And you have sort of universal agreement that more generally, the fact that trademark law is content-based, um, everyone agrees that that is okay, and the history and tradition is, is relevant there, including Justice Sotomayor. Um, in terms of Section 2C, the name section, I think there's a lot of disagreement for what the history and traditional trademark law gets you. Justice Barrett, in particular, takes issue with that, as uh, Barbara is going to talk about some more. Um, you see Justice Thomas right, really avoiding a broader framework um, for discussing um, um, constitutionality of, of various trademark measures relative to the First Amendment and using history and tradition instead. And he said that this is really not going to be everything you have, but history and tradition suffices here. Um, Justice Barrett takes issue with some of this. He does, she does agree that it's important, for, um, you know, that, you know, you look at history and tradition more generally in terms of content, um, neutral measures. <laughs> In terms of whether discrimination on the basis of content or is viewpoint neutral, she also uses this analogy to a limited public forum, um, which Justice Thomas takes issue with. Whether you know, she points out it's only an analogy, not direct. Um, and it goes forward. Justice Sotomayor, on the other hand, is really critical of history and tradition, um, as she has been in other cases, most notably the Bruin case. Um, which she mentions explicitly and mentions the Rahimi case, which was then pending. Um, she would use instead of a public benefit analysis to say, well, is this supplying a public benefit? And so we're gonna go to we're gonna go to we're gonna go to each panelist in order and then go have a little discussion about it and then go to the audience for more questions. So Barbara, do you want to talk a little bit about the history here? Sure. 
um, so I'm very interested in the history of trademarks. Uh, and so I was fascinated by the reliance here, but uh, in terms of actually exploring the uh, history and Justice Barrett's concurrence was justified in its skepticism of the majority's use of history here to try to show that the names clause uh, has a basis in kind of the common law of trademarks uh, in the Anglo-American tradition. Uh, because in, in fact, and, and when I first sort of looked at this, I thought this, this is sort of the opposite of what I understood. Um, and there's this conflation with the idea of there being a kind of natural right to use your own name in trade which is there with this idea of being able to stop other people from using um, a recognizable name in the course of trade, which isn't there unless that name has somehow become um, a trademark and is treated like a, a trademark. Um, and we see this actually in the, the kind of the history of advertising in the late 19th century. I mean, you had Benjamin Harrison on stomach medicines, Herbert Spencer on uh, cigars, um, Mrs. Grover Cleveland on practically everything, including cosmetic arsenic tablets. Uh, and there really wasn't a way to stop people um, from using your name on these things most of the time. Um, we start seeing the, you know, 1890, you've got the, the right to privacy. And so this starts to be uh, something that's debated. Uh, and that's where actually uh, that the INTA's amicus brief where they said, you know, Section 2C is really more about um, making trademark law consistent with privacy and publicity rights is correct. And this is where we also see a divergence with the traditional um, English uh, law approach, where in uh, the 1840s and, and through the 1890s, you had occasional cases where you did have people whose names were used on things. So there's um, the Clark case, um, Clark v. Freeman from 1848 where a, a physician, the kind of royal physician, his name or a very similar name was used to sell um, these you know, in, ineffective medications. And he didn't have any basis for an action because he wasn't a competitor. He wasn't, this was more a libel issue. And the, um, the court didn't have any jurisdiction um, over, it was an inequity, he did, there was no jurisdiction over a libel case. So in fact, the, the traditional English cases kind of go the opposite way and kind of continue to do so because the English law never developed a right of privacy, right of publicity in the same way that we started to see in the US. Now, one thing that um, Justice Barrett was wrong about was in saying that there hadn't been a basis in the 1905 Act or the earlier Acts pre-Lanham Act um, for 2C. So in 1905, there was a, um, a pr prohibition on registering a portrait without the consent of the, uh, the person in the portrait. And this was associated sometimes with registering a name as a trademark because you could register a mere name if it was associated with the portrait. And this was in direct reaction to the um, Roberson versus Rochester Folding um, Box Company case from New York in 1902, where there was a huge public outcry when the Court of Appeal in New York refused to um, give any remedy to a young woman whose photograph was used in advertising, leading to kind of the first privacy laws in the United States. So interestingly, the first version of the 1905 Act didn't have, uh, the proposals from the committee didn't have anything about um, prohibiting or requiring people's permission to use their portraits. But after this case comes out, we start seeing more discussion of this public outcry. And so this sort of pseudo privacy um, clause gets inserted into the 1905 Act and we see that turn into what is now the names clause. Thank you. Um, it's really interesting stuff. And I think it really illustrates some, some of the difficulties of the Supreme Court um, doing history. It obviously has important things to say, but there's limits to how much the justice can perhaps do. So Lisa, um, I'd love to love to hear more from you about the decision. Sure. Thanks, V, for inviting me and Edith for hosting us today. So, uh, so Barbara's right that right section two C, which bans registration of a the name or a portrait, right signature of a living person, um, is really just protecting the rights of publicity and the rights of privacy. And I agree with Inta that uh, this law actually protects those rights. 
Um, and so I think it's really interesting that the court did not engage with the fact that, that that's what the purpose of this law is. You see some of the justices uh, really just talking about the general purposes of trademark law, right? To facilitate source identification or prevent source confusion. And so I think that's one of the things that I was frustrated about, about the opinion is that they didn't really engage with the goal of this law. And that's critical if you're going to do a First Amendment analysis of a law, regardless of whether you're using one of these uh, constitutional frameworks like strict scrutiny analysis, intermediate scrutiny analysis, et cetera. Um, so I think one thing that's really important to focus on is that there is actually a lot of agreement in the opinion, um, and this is going to be relevant both for trademark lawyers and possibly also free speech lawyers, right? First, everyone in, in uh, all of the justices agreed that, uh, that substantive trademark laws are content-based laws, right? They regulate speech based on its content. Uh, some laws uh, regulate speech based on its viewpoint, right? Tam and Brunetti are examples of laws that, that did. Um, but that's, I think, really important uh, because before it was not really sure or not really clear to me whether the court was going to embrace the fact this was a content-based law. So number two, um, oh, I'm sorry, that, that trademark laws are content-based. Um, and, and so then number two, the court says that um, if the law is not just content-based, but also a viewpoint-based law, right, discriminates based on viewpoint, um, then it's going to be subject to heightened scrutiny under the court's uh, cases like Tam and Brunetti. Um, and then three, everyone agrees that heightened scrutiny is not automatically required for a viewpoint neutral law that's content based. Um, and then finally, they all agree that Section 2C, right, is a uh, content based but viewpoint neutral law. Um, and then as, as V noted, uh, right, we have disagreement about whether the justices should adopt an overall framework for evaluating the constitutionality of registration laws and or uh, enforcement laws, um, and then what kind of approach should be used. Um, but I think it's really critical to note that there is a partial free speech framework for trademark law that you can get from Elster and Tam and Bernetti. Right. So first you ask, is, does, it, does this particular trademark law that's being challenged discriminate based on viewpoint? And so um, here, right, it did not. Uh, so then you move on to the second question, right? Is there a, a historical tradition of viewpoint neutral restrictions on this type of speech in trademark law? And that's where you see Justice Thomas uh, and, and the other uh, conservative uh, male justices say that, yes, there is this history and tradition um, of, of regulations of names, but but one of the debates here is, do they, is it too general, right? Should they focus just narrowly on laws that are identical to this law, or can they just look at any kinds of regulations about names? And then the other dispute, as mentioned uh, by Svi and Barbara, is what time period are we looking at, right? This is clearly not an originalist decision. This is really just a decision that looks to history and tradition. How far into the future do we go, um, I think is an important question. Um, if uh, if this law, there is no historical pedigree for this type of law, right? Dilution law is an example, right? Then the question is whether this uh, law is consistent with uh, the Constitution for other reasons. Now, myself, others have argued that dilution law is does actually discriminate based on viewpoint. We might talk about that later. But even if the justices find that it's a viewpoint neutral law, um, uh, advocates for trademark dilution law can't point to a historical pedigree for that law. So then finally, right, what kind of constitutional approach do we use going forward? Um, well, what's, one thing I found very interesting is that none of the justices in Elster mentioned central Hudson or intermediate scrutiny analysis. Um, and we have uh, Justices Barrett, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson uh, say, saying that if we're talking about trademark registration laws, uh, we should use a reasonableness attest, uh, which is uh, because uh, these trademark registration laws, which confer a government benefit, are similar to uh, these other kinds of regulations in limited public forum law or the government subsidy cases. And, and as V noted, right, they're, they're not saying that it's identical. They're just saying it's similar to this in some ways. Um, okay, right. So if, if the reasonableness test is that we then say identify the purpose of the law and ask if the law directly furthers that purpose, fine. But one of the problems I have with Justice Barrett and Sotomayor's opinions is that they don't focus on the specific purpose of this law here, protecting the rights of publicity and privacy. They talk about the general goals of trademark law, right? Again, facilitating uh, source identification of products, uh, perhaps 
preventing source confusion. Um, so I think that's one critique I have of their opinion. And I agree with Justice Barrett's critique of, of the majority's opinion that it seems like you're just picking among your, you know, uh, you're look, looking in a crowded party looking for your friends, right? When you're trying to decide which provisions might support your arguments that this law is constitutional. So going forward, what do we do with uh, regard to other trademark registration and, enfor and enforcement laws uh, when someone challenges them or what do courts do? Well, uh, if, if this is a law that's regulating speech that is categorically outside the scope of the First Amendment's protections, fraudulent speech, misleading commercial speech, right, obscene speech, um, those laws are probably going to be constitutional, right? So uh, many have said that that's why infringement law is constitutional, although the likelihood of confusion standard is pretty low. So I, I might quibble with the fact that, you know, in some cases, infringement laws may not be constitutional. Uh, but I think that there's a very uh, strong likelihood that uh, that the court will consider the constitutional dilution law in the future. In the VIP products, uh, Jack Daniels case, uh, there is a challenge to dilution law. Well, that's dilution by tarnishment law. I, I actually have argued in a paper, free speech challenges to trademark law after Tamina Bernetti, that the blurring law is also unconstitutional because it discriminates based on viewpoint. So it'll be interesting to see what happens um, in the courts. Um, and uh, one thing I do want to highlight, though, is that um, there has to be a difference in approach if you're talking about trademark registration laws versus trademark enforcement laws. Um, some folks might look to the opinion and say, oh, well, four justices, right, Barrett, Sotomayor, Kagan, Jackson, support a, re a use of a reasonableness test in trademark law. But that's just for trademark registration laws, because they all know that these laws don't actually prohibit you from speaking. They allow you to continue to use the mark on t-shirts or in other ways. Um, it's just that you can't the exclusive right to stop other people from speaking, including the person with that particular name or portrait, etc. Um, so uh, in trademark enforcement laws, infringement dilution laws actually can uh, result in the court banning your speech and, and uh, awarding monetary damages, which can, can chill speech uh, in in, in uh, very problematic ways. So uh, lots of interesting things about the case, but I think I'll, I'll uh, let uh, Eugene uh, talk next about his views on the case. Well, that's a great segue, uh, Eugene. I'd love to hear your views on the case. Uh, so uh, first, uh, uh, I very much appreciate everybody else's comments. Uh, I think they're basically quite sound. Um, I just want to step back a little bit uh, and ask, what does this mean for free speech law more broadly. Uh, so we see in the Second Amendment context that the court is saying that generally speaking, restrictions of the right to keep and bear arms are constitutional to the extent that they have a uh, solid anchor in history, preferably framing era history, although possibly perhaps also late 1800s history around the uh, enactment of the 14th Amendment. Uh, but that's in part that happened in part because uh, in the Second Amendment area, there was really very little precedent setting forth any contrary rules. In the free speech area, in Elster, we see the majority saying something, something quite similar. Actually, I shouldn't say the majority. I'm, I should specifically focus on uh, Justice Thomas's opinion, which on this score uh, is, uh, uh, is joined by, uh, uh, by uh, three justices. And... Um, uh, uh, Justices Kavanaugh uh, and Chief Justice Roberts have a separate opinion that say, oh, yeah, history is really important, but maybe maybe it's not going to take us as far as some might think. Uh, so let's say three justices seem to be willing to adopt that in the free speech area as to trademark law. One question is, would they be willing to adopt it in the free speech area more broadly? Uh, so for uh, so. Uh, uh, for example, uh, there, during the framing era, it's pretty clear there were blasphemy laws, which is to say laws that forbid statements about religion that might be seen as offensive by members, especially of the majority religion. And I, I'm not just talking about swearing. I'm talking about making statements denying the divinity of Jesus or possibly harsher things. Uh, there was a, a common line which led to some persecutions, which suggested that uh, uh, the Virgin Mary was a loose woman because she had this child out of wedlock. And that was the real explanation and not, and not uh, a, a miracle. Um, so in any event, uh, let's say some state wanted to reenact 
blasphemy laws. Now, by the way, the latest, the last blasphemy persecutions that I had noticed uh, in the um, or noticed that, that I have come across in doing some research have, were in the 20th century and the 1940s and before that in the 1920s. Um, and of course, it was only in the 1950s that the Supreme Court rejected blasphemy-based restrictions on, on films. Uh, that, that was the, the, the Burstyn case. Um, so imagine some state reenacts those laws. Would the court be willing to say, you know, we're going to overturn our precedents uh, uh, rejecting a blasphemy exception? In fact, we're going to reject our precedents more broadly, uh, forbidding viewpoint discrimination. Instead, we're going to go back to framing era history. Um, I doubt it. I mean, even the, the lead opinion says, well, viewpoint discrimination is impermissible, uh, even though, again, at least as to blasphemy, it's pretty clear that viewpoint discrimination was authorized at the time. But more broadly, we have basically almost a century of uh, free speech case law from the court. There was a smattering of free speech cases before the 1930s uh, and uh, dissent, uh, 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 before the dissenting opinions of the late 19-teens. But basically, we're talking about the last 100 years in which the court has decided hundreds of free speech cases. Uh, so one question is, would it be willing to, or would enough justices be willing to return to original meaning as a general matter? and perhaps framing our tradition as a general matter uh, in the face of all of those precedents. I'm skeptical. Again, I think even in this case, uh, uh, two of the justices uh, in the majority signaled some skepticism about that. Two of the justices who would otherwise, were otherwise in the majority uh, signaled some skepticism about that. Um, uh, but this is something that I think we should we should think about. And by the way, I think that federalists who are big believers in original meaning, but also big believers in free speech, might want to ask themselves, you know, what do we think uh, 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 about uh, uh, about uh, some evidence that perhaps the original meaning uh, of uh, the First Amendment wasn't that speech protective? Recall, of course, the Sedition Act controversy of the late 1700s. Uh, now, to be sure, it's kind of complicated. Uh, uh, the Jeffersonians rejected the Sedition Act in part on free speech grounds. You might say that the election of 1800 kind of reaffirmed in maybe in some measure that that was the uh, uh, the popular view at the time. And the, the representatives, uh, uh, there was very little overlap between the first Congress that enacted the First Amendment or that proposed the First Amendment and the Congress, I think the fifth Congress that submitted the Sedition Act. There was actually only, only a handful of, uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, uh, congressmen uh, were the same in both. But still, there's some pretty significant evidence that uh, uh, the, the fra in the framing era, at the very least, modern broad conception of free speech and free press were not fully formed. And quite possibly, the dominant conceptions may have been much less speech protective. So that's the real question that I think a lot of people are asking. I'm inclined to say that precedent has tremendous force for justices. Obviously, they're willing to reverse some such precedent. Uh, but uh, you can't have the system running where everything is always up for grabs. Um, so I'm inclined to say that most of the free speech precedents are not going to go by the wayside. And one piece of evidence is, again, the, the justice's insistence that at least at the some core of free speech, the prohibition of viewpoint discrimination, uh, that, that's just a rule that they're not going to depart from. Uh, but this, but still, this would be an interesting question. Of course, the uh, the uh, uh, area in which the, there's been the most signal of possible change and reversal of precedent, in part in the name of um, uh, of uh, uh, original meaning, is libel law. So obviously, this is not a libel case. Uh, the the legal rules are very different, and the First Amendment arguments, in many ways, are very different. But Justices Thomas and Gorsuch, and interestingly. Back in the day, Justice Kagan, before she was a justice, when she was Professor Kagan, have expressed some skepticism about New York Times v. Sullivan. And certainly it's a hard decision uh, to justify uh, on originalist grounds. Again, much is uncertain about the original meaning of the First Amendment. But the one thing that's quite certain is that there was a libel exception and it was actually fairly broad, considerably broader than New York Times v. Sullivan suggests. Um, so, so it may be that uh, uh, that uh, 
this kind of uh, of, of reasoning, like in the like in the Elster case, uh, uh, may end up um, may end up uh, uh, coming back if there is if the court does grant review in a case to reconsider New York Times v. Sullivan. I want to flag one other thing uh, that is a practical importance to lawyers and to content industries that that uh, uh, this case might implicate, and that's the right of publicity. So the right of publicity is often labeled as the right to exclusive commercial use of your name and likeness, the like, right to stop others from using your name and likeness for commercial purposes. That one-liner is obviously an overstatement, a massive overstatement. For example, if somebody writes an unauthorized biography or makes a movie in which some of the characters are real people, uh, that is using another person's name or likeness for commercial purposes, the publisher and the movie maker are commercial entities, uh, but uh, it, it's well established for combination of First Amendment reasons and tort law and statutory reasons, uh, that kind of speech is not, cannot be covered by the right of publicity. But there are a lot of questions. First of all, of course, as to commercial uses in the sense of commercial advertising, where, where the right of publicity would preclude even non-misleading uses in commercial advertising. For example, if it's clear that a person's per person's voice, let's say, or image was impersonated or is created by AI, they could even say, this is fiction. Celebrity appearance impersonated. Uh, nonetheless, the right of publicity would block uh, 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 would block that use unless the advertiser gets consent. But beyond that, uh, there are also a lot of right of publicity cases involving uh, speech that does not form fall within the commercial speech quasi exception. That's not commercial advertising, but that's also somehow seen as kind of less worthy than books, films, newspaper articles, and the like. Classic examples are merchandising, T-shirts with people's images. Obviously, a T-shirt with text on it can be fully protected speech. Consider Cohen v. California, the fuck the draft. Jacket case. Uh, that was a jacket, but I, I'm pretty confident the rules would be the same for a T-shirt. At the same time, uh, when people sue over unauthorized T-shirts bearing their bearing their name, they they tend to prevail or name or likeness. Um, so it's uh, 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 things things like that: T-shirts, coffee mugs, bobbleheads, potentially, and the like. The other area which has been gotten very important recently, of course, is video games. And there have been several cases which have generally held that uh, the right of publicity can be used to block the use of sports figures, not even necessarily name or likeness, but attributes of identity. Some of these cases have involved uh, a uh, like some fantasy sports uh, game where a person's uh, 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 a, a, people can play someone who obviously seems like that person as a character. They have the same general build, they have the same team name, they have the same number, but they don't actually use the name. Nonetheless, right of publicity infringement and courts have rejected First Amendment claims. Yet we know from the violent video game case that video games are fully protected by the First Amendment. So this is a practically very important area. One of the important things that, that, is, that the court offhandedly says, and I think on this all the justices agree, is that the law in Elster was a content-based law. It was viewpoint neutral, but content-based. Why was it content-based? Because it distinguishes use of another person's name from other uses, from, from other speech, right? Perfectly sensible. And yet, uh, quite a few lower courts have in the past tried to fuzz that over. Not all, but quite a few. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the implication that content-based restrictions generally lead to strict scrutiny would cast very serious doubt on the constitutionality of right of publicity law. Uh, now, of course, one possibility is to argue, well, there, there's historical basis for the right of publicity the way there is for copyright law, for trademark law, and therefore they sort of form quasi-exceptions from the First Amendment. But the historical basis for the right of publicity is much sketchier. It dates back most clearly to the early 1900s, although there may be some antecedents before, as opposed to copyright law, which of course is mentioned in the constitution, existed from the outset, and trademark law, which at least in its common law, state law form, also existed uh, in the late 1700s. So an important uh, possible consequence of Elster to watch.
Thank you. So, you know, there's uh, um, talking about riot publicity. Of course, Barbara mentioned a Roberson case and 1905 Act. And Roberson, of course, is a judge saying you have no right to control your image. And then the New York State Legislature, I believe, overrules that. And it leads to a reaction. But that's a very interesting um, sort of signpost if you want to argue understandings of right publicity before 1904 before mm -hmm. century. Um, now, of course, we see, I think we're probably going to get a federal, some sort of right, right publicity law in the next year, either for deep fakes, NIL for college athletics is also very much on people's minds. And how do we think that this decision plays out in for that's for deep fakes in um, coming years? I just I'm sorry to pop a question, everyone. There's something something that seems sort of um, interesting. Yeah. This is actually something I've thought about a bit, uh, and in part I was thinking about it because I, I was so interested in, in looking at the kind of the history of the 1905 Act. I didn't actually mention too that that I'm not just reading this idea of um, that that being rooted in privacy. It was recognized at the time. So even um, in the James Love Hopkins, his um, treatise in 1905, he said explicitly, the right of privacy has been recognized by the patent office and as to portraits of living individuals, the act of 1905 prohibits the registration without the consent of the person. So it was it was explicitly recognized at the time as being rooted in, um, well, privacy, uh, which then becomes kind of publicity. Uh, and, and I was just very interested in this idea, though, that would it be possible that this would, you know, how would you do a, a kind of originalist, um, you know, history and tradition approach to a um, a kind of publicity, you know, commercial publicity right? And uh, and it would it would be hard to do. There are just there really there are so many cases that go the other way. I mean, there are the, uh, some that do support this this idea of privacy or publicity, but most of the, the Anglo-American case law goes the other way. Um, so I, I think you'd, you'd, you'd struggle with it. And in terms of the, the deep fakes thing, what you could have though is common law passing off. So in, I mentioned in the, under English law, there is no right of publicity uh, as such. So you you, know, you had a case of McCulloch versus um, May in 19, I think 43, 1948, somewhere around uh, that, that where this Uncle Mac, the name was used on cereal. He, it was a non-competing um, product. So he's a radio personality. It's using his name on a cereal box. That's not gonna be passing off because you're not you know, making a misrepresentation. They're not, there isn't a common field of activity. But today, um, under kind of English uh, law, common law, you can occasionally use passing off to prevent um, names and images being used where it is misrepresenting to the public that there is some kind of endorsement by that person. But it doesn't work in all cases. Sometimes if, if the image is just be of a celebrity is just being used as a kind of badge of affiliation or um, support uh, and the, there isn't a misrepresentation, then it won't work. But we could see this working with deep fakes. So that's right. It's a long way to come around to how this applies to deep fakes is in that there is this you, you could use this kind of common law kind of passing off misrepresentation, harming the goodwill, um, people being confused as to the actual you know, endorsement or affiliation or participation in that um, under the common law. So. so if I could, oh, I'm sorry, Lisa, oh. sorry. Well, I was just going to say, so right uh, recently, a bipartisan group of senators proposed a bill called the No Fakes Act. And uh, my, my thoughts on this is that we really need to separate out these deep fakes into three different categories. Number one, and as Barbara had mentioned, right, uh, false statements uh, that someone is actually the person uh, that, that's being represented. Uh, uh, number two, uh, sexually explicit deep fakes, which I think a lot of folks would say that there is a stronger government interest in regulating those. And then lastly, uh, the use of someone's identity in a way that's not confusing. Perhaps there's been a disclaimer uh, where the, the AI company are, is very clear that this is not the person, kind of like what, what Eugene was mentioning before. Uh, but we want to protect the right of publicity or more specifically the right of performance, right? So we have a Supreme Court case, Zakini, uh, where the Supreme Court seemed to indicate that if you're protecting somebody to earn, somebody's uh, ability to earn a living, right, to perform, that that might be constitutional, right? Satisfy some form of constitutional scrutiny. 
Um, and I, again, if it's a false or misleading uh, speech, especially commercial speech, I think that's going to be found constitutional in, in the right of publicity context. But it's not so clear, uh, right? Uh, what about these non-confusing uses? And in Elster, there is a decent amount of language about uh, someone's reputation and goodwill, right? And that we don't want to prevent people from free writing off of that. And so folks that uh, might cite that kind of language in Elster to support uh, right of publicity laws in the federal context. Um, but, uh, you know, again, there's some there's some uh, limitations in the proposed bill uh, for certain kind of free speech type of activities, right? Use in docudramas, commentary, parody, et cetera. So I think it's, you know, it's a very interesting issue. And, and we'll see if, if uh, Congress does decide to adopt some sort of narrowly targeted bill banning uh, unauthorized digital replicas um, or a more broadly a federal right of publicity law. When uh, there was a discussion draft of the bill circulated a couple months ago, they were considering a federal right of publicity law, but the most the bill does not have a broad federal right of publicity law. So it'll be interesting to see if that if that changes if they do push for that. So uh, I'm it's hard I, I'm not completely up on the, the the titles in this situation, but I think I'm the reporter for. Uh, U Uniform Law Commission project on deepfakes. So we've had to think a lot about these things and not clear what, what proposal there will be, if there will be one. But uh, I, I've been focusing on it for a couple of years. Um, I totally agree with the classification that, that Lisa points out, or the, rather the splitting. Deepfakes cover a lot of things. And the way that I think of it are, uh, to, to track Lisa's categories, uh, deception, dignity, dollars. Some of the concern is people are going to think that this person, this is real. And that might, for example, affect election campaigns, uh, where, of course, the speech is fully protected, and might also affect uh, advertising, where the speech is uh, uh, less protected, and one, of course, where misleading advertising is already prohibitable and prohibited generally. Second category is dignity, that even if somebody says, this is totally a fake image of this movie star or of my neighbor having sex, it's not real. I just had a computer make it up. In fact, I'm proud of it. I, I want to stress that it's not real because that shows my skill at using the software. Well, there's still a concern about dignity there uh, that people might say, you know, you shouldn't be able to distribute sexually themed material containing somebody else's image. Note the very important point about being sexually themed material. Uh, if you want to distribute a movie containing somebody's image because someone is included as a character, like in Midnight in Paris or Forrest Gump and such. I think there's a First Amendment right well established to do that. But the theory is that sex is different here. Uh, and the third category is dollars, that just the concern about unfair competition. The one case in which the Supreme Court has upheld the right of publicity, the Zucchini case, is specifically had to do, the court stressed, with using someone's uh, 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 someone's uh, um, image to uh, essentially to copy their entire act, because that it's kind of like, so it's a form of unfair competition, kind of like copyright infringement, but for, for non-copyrightable works. The court, by the way, they're stressed that it wasn't considering the more common right of publicity claim of just use of name and likeness more broadly. So interestingly, tying deep fakes to Elster as to the dignity point, I think that following Elster, one of the strongest arguments for restricting deep fakes, which to be sure lower courts have not accepted, but I think if it comes to the Supreme Court, I think some justices will be quite open to it, is that this falls within a historical exception for obscenity. Now, to be sure, not all porn deep fakes fall within this three prong test that the court devised in Miller v. California to cabin that exception. But that test was in part justified, or rather, even broader protection for speech, just rejection of an obscenity exception as the dissenters would have had uh, uh, or uh, um, uh, would have done, excuse me, um, uh, or the, the, to the extent the Miller test uh, does accept a, a, yeah, an obscenity exception, it's a narrow one. One reason for its narrowness is consenting adults, right? If people want to see porn in the privacy of their own homes or even in a movie theater, you know, they should be entitled to consume whatever speech they want. Now, if it's not adults, if it's children, we have restrictions. If it's not consenting, well, there was a suggestion even in one of the dis, dis, uh, dissenting opinions in Miller that if this is kind of thrust upon unwilling listeners, maybe there might be more permissible restrictions. I think that's also potentially a way of defending 
uh, both non-consensual porn, non-deepfake uh, restrictions, and restrictions on deepfake porn. Uh, that, uh, uh, that historically it's been understood that sex is different, that certain kinds of obscenity restrictions are permissible. We don't need to go back to the attitudes towards porn of 1791, where of course the technology was somewhat different as well, but there were in fact restrictions, quite broad restrictions and obscenity. We don't need to go back to that, but at least we can recognize that there has been this historical exception and that therefore the use of non-consenting people's images might fit within that exception. Note that's not a strict scrutiny argument. It's not an argument there's a compelling interest in preserving privacy. That could be an alternative argument. it would be interesting to see how willing the court is to accept that given that it's been rejecting that as to the Second Amendment in Rahimi. Uh, but it is, rather it's something that tries to, again, use history and here indubitable history that there was an accepted uh, obscenity exception uh, to, to possibly kind of adjust uh, uh, and, uh, and possibly adjusting that exception in light of this relatively new development in porn, uh, uh, um, I guess, porn technology. You know, as uh, uh, the Copyright Office came out with this digital replica, replica report just about two or three weeks ago, and in it they described the, um, first, the first, first Amendment principles of right, right publicity cases as a dumpster fire. So it's going to be interesting to see um, what happens if we're ever quoting Roberta Qual on that. Um, well, so we have this decision. We have, um, and we're sort of looking at deep fakes and all this stuff. And more generally, for trademark law, what's the standard going to be? I mean, is it just going to be, are, are, are we all going to be in high demand doing history? I really hope so. Um, or what do we do where there isn't history and tradition? It goes back far enough. What do we think the standard is going to be? I guess it's a hard question. Well, I mean, I guess I hope so. I mean, uh, you know, I'd like it to be helpful for my work. <laughs> right. So, so look, I mean, lawyers all the time have looked for old cases and new cases, right, that support their arguments. And so, uh, so I don't think that, you know, uh, although they're going to highlight, I think, the history and tradition more now after the Elster case. Uh, but I think, again, it's just important to note that that most of trademark law both registration law and enforcement law will be constitutional after Tam and Bernetti and Elster, right? We have so many different laws that actually regulate uh, fraudulent speech, right? So misleading commercial speech. Um, and um, so, so those kinds of laws are going to be fine. Uh, we also have a number of laws that promote competition and the ability of marks to actually identify the source of goods and services, right? So these provisions that ban registration of generic terms or descriptive terms without secondary meaning. Um, so I think that uh, the, the potential problematic uh, laws are going to be, uh, some have said the flags, uh, the law banning registration of flags, although I think there's a good argument, right? We have treaties that, that require us to, um, to uh, not register the flags of other countries. And, and in the end, right, a registration actually gives you exclu an exclusive right to stop other people from using the flag. And so my, my take and, and several papers that I've written is that the registration laws actually uh, are, are, are pro free speech because they're when they ban registration of certain kinds of uh, uh, phrases or symbols, they actually leave them in the public domain av available for everyone to use. Um, the more uh, potentially problematic laws are the trademark enforcement laws that aren't regulating speech categorically outside the scope of the First Amendment's protections. And that would be dilution law, right? It does apply to commercial speech. Um, so some would say that it's it's therefore more likely to be consistent with the First Amendment. But, but kind of, I was thinking about Eugene's comment earlier about the fact that um, if we look back to the history of free speech law, blasphemy was prohibited. Commercial speech used to not be protected by the First Amendment, right? It's not until recently uh, Virginia Board of Pharmacy, you know, Central Hudson, where we see non-misleading commercial speech protected, right, and subject and regulations subject to intermediate scrutiny analysis. So, so I think that uh, there is a significant chance that dilution law could be struck down either on the ground that it discriminates based on viewpoint, um, that there's no historical tradition, and that if you subject it to some sort of intermediate level of scrutiny, maybe we don't call it Central Hudson scrutiny, but something higher than kind of a rational basis or a test, um, there's a chance that it would be struck down because that law applies across industries and, and, and basically gives one company who spent a lot of money promoting their brand 
uh, the right to stop others from using a similar phrase or symbol in connection with the sale of any goods and services when there's no confusion. Well, that's a good segue, actually, to a case we didn't talk about. Uh, Jake Linford has a question in the Q&A saying, in light of Jack Daniels' case uh, versus VIP products, and the court's unwillingness to constitutionalize what it saw as a standard confusion dispute be between litigants, how certain are you that Ulster's relaxed historical reasonableness standard will be cabined or rejected in litigation contexts? Well, or do well you let me just say, um, copyright law has long been seen as its own, its own kind of exception to First Amendment, in part because not just copyright is mentioned in the Constitution, commerce is mentioned in the Constitution, commerce, interstate commerce, but it doesn't mean the government has power to restrict speech in interstate commerce, or the government has the power to restrict speech through the post office, even though the post office is mentioned. Rather, it's that the framers clearly understood copyright law as a permissible kind of law, even though even back then it was a, it was a form of speech restriction. Any exclusive control over certain kinds of speech is a form of speech restriction. So from Harper and Rowe on, the court has routinely essentially said there's a First Amendment exception, more or less. It hasn't put it in those words, but more or less for copyright law. And that actually fits very well within this court's recent move to tradition, because there is this very longstanding tradition, one, one tradition we can speak with great confidence to. Um, uh, or one of the few traditions we can speak with great confidence to. So I think I think the general sense is what happens, not quite what happens in copyright, stays in copyright, but that, yes, uh, various kinds of restrictions are permissible through copyright law, various kinds of uh, limits on referring to other people's works, uh, using doctrines that are just would not be acceptable elsewhere. So now maybe it might have some extension to trademark law in some measure, but uh, I, I would uh, I would uh, would think that uh, uh, that at least outside of trademark and copyright, I just don't think that the uh, that the, the copyright rules are going to have much force. Just to give one example, uh, one of the things that the court in Harper and Rowe says is, look, you know, copyright doesn't allow anybody to monopolize ideas or facts just means they can't use the very particular kind of expression to convey their view. Um, uh, 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 look at all of the other kinds of uh, uh, expression they can use instead. But that's, of course, exactly the attitude that the court rejected as to uh, vulgarities in Cohen v. California, as to flag burning in Texas v. Johnson and such. So there seem to be specialized rules within the copyright context, rightly or wrongly. Yeah, and if I could can add to that, uh, so in the copyright law context, right, one of the reasons the court found uh, copyright law to be consistent with the First Amendment is because of the idea, expression, dichotomy, and the fair use uh, defense, which is codified. In trademark law, uh, we don't have, uh, I, I think, such a protective system for, for what can qualify as protectable subject matter in trademark law. Almost anything can qualify as a mark. Uh, we do have some limits, right? It has to be distinctive, not functional. Uh, but, I, but I think that's a potential problem in trying to import this approach and copyright to trademark. And then also, right, there are not a lot of statutory defenses to infringement. There are some to dilution law. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, it, it would hard, be hard to say that, it, well, as long as, uh, you know, uh, uh, because we have uh, some defenses that, that therefore a trademark law is constitutional. Um, again, dilution law is a more recent addition to the federal trademark law and even to some state trademark law statutes. So, so we can't look to history and tradition to justify dilution law. Um, and with regard to, uh, I mean, Jack Daniels did say that normally the trademark law plays well with the First Amendment, um, but uh, it also you see some language in there saying that there, there can be exceptions for parody um, and a concern about uh, infringement cases where the only type of confusion is confusion about permission, right? Consent, approval. Um, so, so I think that uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, going forward. But I don't think the court is just going to defer now to Congress and say, "Oh, everything's fine uh, after Elster." Yeah, I think just following what Lisa was saying and, and comparing the two, it, it's um, you know when we look at the idea expression dichotomy being a basis for arguing, "Oh, well, it's not in conflict with." 
um, with freedom of speech because there are there's room the the scope of protection is not so wide um, that there's a direct conflict. Uh, theoretically, the scope of trademark protection is supposed to be narrower than that of copyright protection. And so an argument might be based on, well, actually with dilution, it's a lot wider, it's a lot broader protection than it used to be. Um, it may be even as broad as copyright protection, um, arguably. I want to commend uh, Lisa's talk of a 2021 National Lawyers Conference, which goes into some of the issues regarding First Amendment and dilution as well, which is available on on the Federal Society website, um, which in turn has a video video host on YouTube. Um, it's yeah, the, the, the dilution question is really fascinating. I don't quite. I don't see the court um, overruling it, and I do see them finding some maybe. I'm not sure if we're going to find history and tradition for dilution. It's interesting. I, I, at least for blurring, element tarnishment is really the area where it, where it's going to be the hardest junction. But they've been very unwilling. I, I have to think. I think de facto with tarnishment, they've narrowed. They've narrowed tarnishment in practice to hold it to hold it constitutional. I think perhaps on some of the grounds that Eugene is talking about, linking it to obscenity casually. I, um, but. I'm not yeah, sure. I, I'm sorry, Lizzie. I have to disagree. I think when you have Tam and Bernetti saying that uh, is something that's offensive, right? That's a viewpoint. Uh, and uh, we see dilution law, tarnishment law being alleged in contexts where, you know, the the um, the dog toy Chewy Baton cases where they just said it was low quality. But more importantly, though, in contexts involving, at, you know, drug products, sex toys, you know, et cetera. Um, and, and so I think that... Um, at a minimum, tarnishment law is going to be uh, struck down, and I think a number of trade prominent trademark attorneys have taken this position, not just trademark professors. Well, watch this space. Um, I just want to point out before we move on that one of the most surprising things to me is no one in this case seemed to have mentioned Thomas Jefferson's 1793 report recommending a federal trademark law, which perhaps suggests the limitations of doing history in litigation. But uh, that deserves. Uh, stuck out to me. Um, a question really to Eugene, but to everyone, is the relationship of First and Second Amendment here, something, something that Eugene mentioned some, and everyone sort of looking to Rahimi and the Bruin case, are we now having a linkage of First Amendment and Second Amendment? And are we now going to be using this um, Bruin Second Amendment um, standard for trademark law? Well, uh, you know, there's a long tradition of uh, discussing the first and second amendment together. It goes back to some some 1800s cases where courts either said, well, or generally said, well, you know, look at all these rights. They're important rights, but they're not absolute. See the first amendment, see the second amendment. Um, uh, so, and more recently, some uh, courts, including the Supreme Court, said, look, you know, you can't have the first amendment be the uh the the favorite and second uh the second amendment would be kind of an unloved stepchild you need to have similar rules now what does it mean to have similar rules it's hard to tell but there certainly have been similar kinds of uh calls for transferring for example strict scrutiny analysis from the first amendment to the second amendment lower courts were quite willing to do that and also intermediate scrutiny even more often uh Interestingly, the Bruin court and the, uh, uh, rejected that and said, no, there can't be strict scrutiny as, a, as an escape hatch for government uh, restrictions that are not justified by history in the Second Amendment. So one interesting question is to what extent will the court be willing to reimport that back to the First Amendment? So I do think these are these are important questions that the court is going to have to grapple with. But again, one important difference is that as of Heller, you know, there'd been a smattering of Supreme Court cases before that mentioned the Second Amendment. Famously, Miller from 1939 seemed to treat it as not an individual right. A bunch of other cases in passing seemed to treat it as an individual right. But there'd been no real case law setting forth the rules for Second Amendment until Heller. So the court was writing on a mostly blank slate. And because the court had turned, at least the majority had turned to a historical approach, was able to create a pretty historical doctrine, historicized doctrine, one might say. Um, in the free speech area, as I said, there are hundreds of precedents uh, 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 from, from the court uh, on the subject. And uh, 
you know, I could imagine the core trying to sweep out the OG and stable saying, you know, we have to, we have to go back, look at all of this from scratch. But that's generally not what the core does. That's generally not what most justices do, by and large. Um, so, uh, so I'm inclined to say the main difference in the two, other than, of, co of course, you could argue, look, Second Amendment is about guns, which are dangerous in a particular way. First Amendment is about speech, which sometimes dangerous, very, very dangerous. Pretty much all the mass murder in uh, in recent history has come from speech one way or another, uh, but indirectly, so maybe less directly dangerous. So one might say as a, as a normative matter, one should have different rules. Uh, but uh, uh, but even setting that aside, I don't think the court is willing to say that, to say, you know, we are going to deliberately treat the Second Amendment as more, Second Amendment rights as more restrictable for that reason. I think the big difference is going to be in the body of precedent and the court's willingness perhaps to reconsider portions of it, but not the whole kit and kaboot. I, that would be my prediction. Can I ask actually, Eugene, just a quick question about intermediate scrutiny. It seems like the court's been moving away from application of intermediate scrutiny recently. Do you think that they're going to continue to do that or, or not? So it's, it's really hard to tell. Uh, in part because intermediate scrutiny means so many different things in different contexts. So, for example, with commercial advertising, uh, there's been a call by Justice Thomas to basically reject commercial advertising as a less protected category, at least setting aside misleading speech. So you could imagine them adopting strict scrutiny or maybe even a per some sort of per se per prohibition or categorical exception rules for non-misleading commercial advertising. But when it comes to content-neutral restrictions, Virtually nobody thinks the rule should be strict scrutiny or per se invalidation. Various kinds of restrictions on acts, uh, on noise, on blocking streets or blocking sidewalks, a vast range of restrictions have to be tolerable. Of course, one other possibility might be to say, well, it was a mistake to, to view the First Amendment as going in, doing anything beyond uh, uh, protecting speech against restrictions based on content. And when you've got content neutral restrictions, which are basically restrictions on the non-communicative impact on speech, it's too loud, it blocks uh, blocks passageways and such, you know, there should be categorical upholding. Again, I doubt the court is willing to do that. So as, so, uh, as to content neutral restrictions, I think the court has to come up with something. Again, I don't think intermediate scrutiny is a great success story there. But it needs to come up with something other than per se invalidation or per se validation or strict scrutiny. Okay. I, I guess just another quick clarification: Do you think reasonableness approach is similar to rational basis, or do you think those are different? Uh, so the reasonable approach is not the same as rational basis, and my authority for that proposition is Iskand v. Lee, which is a non-public forum case, but of course. When it comes to government programs that, as, as people have pointed out, don't restrict speech but provide extra protection or extra access for speech, those are probably pr properly understood as non-public fora or limited public fora. Uh, so that's where the so Iskan v. Lee, in a sense, is a grandparent case for that, maybe at least a great uncle case for that. And there, the court, to be sure, badly splintered court, struck down a restriction on leafleting in the in in government-owned airports, not beyond the uh, security cordon, but outside the security cordon, on the grounds that restrictions on leafleting are not reasonable. They're viewpoint neutral, but not reasonable. Well, it's easy to come up with a rational basis for restricting leafleting, uh, but the court was adopting something more than just a a, um, a, a, a rational basis. Uh, likewise, in Minnesota Voters Alliance versus Mansky, the court struck down a restriction on political apparel at uh, uh, at um, um, uh, 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 voting places um, uh, on reasonableness grounds. And there was reasonableness as kind of shorthand for a certain kind of vagueness concern. Nonetheless, it was not the rational basis test. So we're we're approaching the end. We have a question. We have a question from Desmond Mantle, and I'm going to interpret it a little bit because his little que his, his actual question is about a T-shirt. But I'm going to tweak it. Just after this case, here here's a fact pattern: someone makes a um, deep fake pornographic with Donald Trump in it, um, before or after a federal deep fake law, 
And bear in mind too, I think Trump and Trump, the Trump brand probably is a famous mark for um, dilution purposes. Would that be actionable after this case under a theoretical deepfake law and under dilution law? What about actual confusion? Um, <laughs> interestingly, I think actual confusion is probably the easiest one. I think there'd be very, you could probably argue that no one, I really hope no one would think that it was um, sponsored um, by the brand. Um, but yeah, any of them. Well, again, I think if it's deceptive, it's no problem to regulate it. If it's not, it's more problematic. And the court really didn't grapple with the right publicity issue, uh, right, that was really at, at the heart of the Section 2C case. So, um, I mean, my take is, who knows? Maybe Eugene has a few points on this one. No, not really. I wouldn't be surprised if that's coming down the pike. I mean, it's going to be these, these, que these questions at a minimum are coming. I don't think history and tradition is quite enough. Well, it's definitely important, but I think... Um, well, and actually, just to clarify, right, if it's obscene, right, then it could be banned, right? Uh, but uh, but I think that's that's the way to think about it, just, you know, systematically, right? Is there a categorical exception? If so, yeah, it's probably okay. If there's no categorical exception here to First Amendment protection, then who knows what the test is going to be after Elster, right, Tam and Bernetti? I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think the, the, the reason I really wanted to have this conversation is because it seems like almost... Things are less are less certain than ever in this area, and there's a ton of money here. And I think answers would be good. I think the Supreme Court eventually has to stop dodging the question of what the standard is going to be, where history and tradition don't provide a guide. So, watch this space. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah, on Thank behalf you. of the Federalist Society. Great pleasure. Thank you so much to Professor Laureate, Professor Ramsey, and Professor Volok for speaking, and Professor Rosen for moderating. We're so grateful for your time and expertise today. Thank you also to our audience for joining us. We greatly appreciate your participation and questions. You can stay up to date with announcements and upcoming webinars on our website, fedsoc.org, or on all major social media platforms. Thank you once more for tuning in, and we are adjourned. <laughs>